Well, um, yeah, let's, let's dive into it. Um, yeah, we are syndicating a nine plex apartment. Um, we're looking to raise $450,000. Well, I guess it's only $400,000 since AJ and I are investing 50,000 together. Um, yeah. So first off, AJ, if you go to the important legal notices, um, this is an investment. It is, it is a risk, um, but we believe that, you know, it will, it will turn out and uh, provide great returns. But um, any, any statements that we make regarding um, any return or, uh, you know, what we expect, um, those are forward looking statements. Um, it is an investment. There's no guarantees. So that with that said, let's, uh, let's jump forward and talk about the investment. Um, yeah. So, um, I am going to pull forward my document. Okay. So, um, yeah, the project is a nine unit, um, apartment complex in the city of Tualatin. And what's great about that is that it's close to Bridgeport Village and as well, the Southwest Corridor Max project is going to be ending it at Bridgeport Village. Um, and that project is set to finish sometime in the next eight to 10 years. So that's an additional upside to this project that we have not factored into any of the numbers. Um, and we're looking to uh, raise $450,000. The purchase price of the, the project is 1.315 million. Um, it's fully occupied and the property is four separate buildings, <clears throat> uh, three duplexes and one triplex. Uh, and the triplex is kind of a town home style property. Um, two tax lots, fully occupied all the tenants are on month-to-month -month agreements um, uh, and rent increases take effect november 1st is that right too chris that is correct um so rents right now are about ten thousand eight hundred, but they will be jumping about 10 percent to eleven thousand seven hundred and fifty um for <clears throat> the negotiations we negotiated down uh the I guess we negotiated a repair credit um, of $63,000 and the, this just goes straight to escrow. Um, so it's, it's operating funds that will help us uh, repair some of the deferred maintenance. We've got a couple roofs that we need to replace, exterior painting um, and then sprucing up the exterior of the property. And then as well, um, each unit we've got a little uh, cosmetic remodel planned out. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about the, the property and the, the project. Um, we're creating a LLC uh, for the syndication and that is basically pass through income um, and as well, any tax benefits will pass through to the members of the LLC. Each person who opts into investing um, into the syndication will become a member of the LLC and that's pretty straightforward. Um, if anybody has specific questions about the LLC, uh, I guess vehicle, um, we're happy to answer them. Um, we've already chatted about the property. It's about 0.75 acres um, and it's west of I-5, or excuse me, east of I-5. Um, near Bridgeport Village in Tualatin and <clears throat> it's a great little hub. Uh, you can pretty much get anywhere north, south, east or west um, and it's it's just a good area and we've always been interested and it's right in our bubble as well. Um, so the value add is pretty straightforward as well. Um, we've got our construction project with the deferred maintenance and the um, cosmetic remodel, but then as well, we are 
going to be transferring the responsibility of utilities from the property owner to the tenants. Um, and this is going to be little more than $100 a month per unit. Um, and when uh, you go through that, it actually turns out to be quite a huge um, increase in the net operating income. Um, it's about... I mean, that's about a 10, about, 10, almost a 10% increase, right, Chris? Yeah. yeah, yep. And that raises the property value quite a bit, actually. Um, so that's another one of our specialties is just making sure that the property is well managed and that we're keeping our costs down. Um, hey Chris, can at I the, ask a question? Yeah. Um, how do you exactly implement that? Are you just doing it on paper and changing their lease midstream or how does that roll out? All the tenants are on month to month agreements currently. So we have to give a, a 90 day notice. Um, we just, let them know that, you know, hey, in, in order to conserve utilities and keep your rents down, um, we're transferring the cost of water, sewer, garbage, um, and any other utility that we're paying for, um, the response, we're transferring the responsibility to the tenant. And then at that point, it's just, um, since, since it's outside of the city of Portland, it's not considered a rent increase. So they just, we just have uh, to wait 90 days to implement that, and then we bill back the utilities. Um, yeah, we do it. We do it through a system called rubs. I mean, typically on the, especially this type of property, there's one uh, water bill per tax lot. So rubs is a rental utility bill back system uh, that allows us to split up whatever common utilities there are and divide it amongst the tenants. Cool. Okay. Um, Chris, did that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thanks for the explanation. Yeah. AJ, why don't you uh, take it away on the construction cost and why don't you dive a little bit into the construction budget and um, a little bit about the value and then we'll chat about profit splits and yeah, so um, we're, we're looking at about $150,000 in the uh, construction budget. Um, and this is, we're, we're looking to do two of the roofs. Uh, one, one of the roofs in particular, uh, the two units underneath it have mold. Uh, so we're going to remove those tenants and fix up those units uh, immediately. Uh, most likely have to replace all the cabinets, flooring, uh, pretty much do the, the whole entire units. Um, the remaining seven units, we're planning on updating the, the flooring uh, to a hard laminate uh, paint, updating the fixtures so it's a little bit, look a little bit better. Probably remove the countertops and replace with a hard surface. Um, on the exterior, uh, there's a little bit of deferred maintenance. Uh, some of the siding needs a tiny bit of repair, uh, mostly paint and then a ton of landscaping. Um, there are uh, some tenants that have not abandoned vehicles, but it definitely just needs some TLC, both from a management standpoint and from a construction standpoint. Um, so we believe that we can get that done uh, with that 150,000 and then uh, possibly if, uh, because we're not doing all of it like immediately, uh, some of the repair costs on those later turnovers will come out of the operating funds. Um, but we believe that we're going to have a higher cash on cash return than 7% when after we've raised rents for majority of the units. Um, so yeah, Chris, you want to go into, does anybody have any questions on that there? I, we have a lot more detail uh, in the, down in the PPM. I can go over that if anybody has any other questions. Cool. Um, Actually, we'll, so if you guys walked every unit, and gone through. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I've walked all the units. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a little bit of deferred maintenance, but, um, they've got good bones and, you know, they're, they're pretty standard apartment remodels that we are very, very comfortable with. And yeah, we just completed an eight plex, um, near the Acura and the Mercedes dealership off Canyon. <clears throat> pretty, 
pretty similar or maybe even worse condition. And we were able to complete that with, um, I think less than $125,000. We had four vacant units that totally had to be completely gutted. Um, we're not having to do, we didn't have to do roofs on that. So that's why I think this budget is a little higher, but all in all, we're very comfortable with the project and we think it's going to be, um, you know, we're, we're going to be able to meet the budget and it's going to be a, a success. So does that answer your question, Chris? <laughs> yep. That's it. Cool. Um, yeah. Why don't we jump back on? Okay. So we talked about the value add. Um, so the preferred return, um, so 7% annually paid out quarterly. Um, if they're, so in the, in the first year we, with the added turnover, um, we expect there's going to be a little bit of a higher vacancy. So if you're diving into the pro forma, you'll see that we've got a little bit of a higher vacancy cost and that, um, makes that cash on cash return less than 7%. Um, so there will be a little bit of a shortfall, um, first year, but we expect, uh, but that will get paid back in the future in the, in the next couple of years. So, um, the preferred return is paid out 100% before any type of profit splits happen. So at minimum, um, that 7% is going to get paid out first. So the way that the, um, I guess, cash flows and capital or excuse me, uh, any distributions are paid out. Capital is paid back first, then the preferred return. And those are both paid out at a hundred percent. Um, and then once we get above that 7%, um, preferred return, and that's all been paid out, then there is a 80, 20 profit split on cash flow. Um, for the sponsors, AJ and I are the sponsors. Um, and <clears throat> then the passive investors, we're also passive investors in the project as well, um, since we're investing uh, $50,000 into it. So we'll own one ninth of the passive, um, uh, yeah, membership. And then if there is a distribution or if there's a, um, yeah, a distribution event in terms of um, the property being sold or refinanced, then the way that those funds are paid out is that all capital is returned um, at 100%. And then any of the 7% um, that may have, there have been a shortage on that 7% um, preferred return. And then it would go 80 20. Um, to the passive investors, 20% to the sponsors, that's AJ and I, and then anything above a 20% IRR would be split 50-50 between um, the passive investors and the sponsors. Um, that 20% IRR goal is it's a pretty high uh, bar to meet, and so we think that that is fair, and that is that's basically the way that all other syndicators run the deal as well. So um, that's why we've chosen to go that way. Um, our targeted returns, we're expecting a 7% um, preferred return, cash on cash, and then a 19.8 five-year project IRR. That's if we sold at five years. Um, if we did a refinance, that number would look a little different, um, but our we'd be able to get our equity back to the passive investors a lot faster. So that's something that we're um, always going to be looking at. And then the equity multiple basically states that on five years with that 19.8% um, IRR, we're going to be returning, you know, if you invested 50 K we'd, we'd be returning, um, 3.18 times that. So I don't know exactly what that is. I think it's close to 160,000 over the course of that five years. So that is kind of diving into the, um, what we expect and hope for 
uh, based on our kind of conservative underwriting at the moment. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I don't have anything to add. Do you guys have any questions about that? Um, I have a question. So what do you as the sponsors, I mean, if you're saying that's a fairly high bar and so forth and you're as a sponsor only getting 20% of the, well, I guess you're getting 50% if the bar is exceeded, but 20% up to that point, is that, does that incentivize you guys enough to be uh, invested in the deal? I mean, how does that look from your side? Um, I'll go first. Um, so this this deal is um, something that AJ and I could have done on our own. And but the real reason why we want to do this deal is because we're very interested in creating the format of this um, syndication so that we can kind of ramp our way up to doing larger deals. Um, this 20% is definitely still interesting. Um, and, you know, since we're bringing our friends and family into the deal, and this is our, we have invested with um, other uh, partnerships. I think we've got like five or six other partnerships that we're in right now with friends and family. But um, it's a, just more of a like a 50-50 partnership or a 66 33 percent this this is a new format that um, we're looking to take to larger apartments so 50 100 units and at that point we wouldn't be able to do that deal ourselves the 20 percent would be extremely interesting and like that's where we see our business going and that's that's something very exciting for us so we're very very invested in making sure that this deal um, goes perfectly smooth and you know we're, we're looking to create word of mouth and um, you know provide great returns for everyone who invests with us like that's this is a, the first step in building a, a good reputation for us and Chris the, the we don't get that 20% unless the investors gotten a hundred percent of their seven percent and a hundred percent of their capital back so there is a very big incentive for, as sponsors, for us to even get paid for this to be a success. Um, in addition, we are investing uh, our own money into it as well. So we will be participating on the uh, investor side, um, but there, there is definitely the motivation for this to be a success. Okay, great, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Anybody else have any uh, questions? This is Jeffrey. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Hi, Glad thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so um, I don't think I've seen uh, comps. I'd love to see comps or maybe you can just briefly talk about them in terms of the, the other end uh, sale price and what those look like. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Chris, you want me to pull up the pro forma or do you want me to go down to the market analysis? So on the, on the sale price at the end, uh, that, yeah, that's uh, something that we need to dive into a little bit more. We're, we're basing it off of kind of a, an appraisal or an underwriting standpoint. Um, just, based off the NOI, once, once you get to a certain, um, you know, like a certain, uh, once, once it kind of gets over a million dollars, the properties really get underwritten at a um, kind of a cap rate and an NOI. So it's, it's a lot harder to pull comps. Um, right, right. You know, there's not a similar nine unit complex that's gonna be bringing in a $110,000 NOI. Um, one thing that we have done on the, on the sale or the exit price is that we have bumped our cap rate um, by a half a percentage point. So right now we're acquiring the property at a six, um, I think it's a 6.2% cap. 
Um, and then after we basically we're taking the property from being like a, a C minus or a D and I believe that we're going to be bumping it up to a B level property or as, or as C plus as we can get. And as well, we're going to be improving the neighborhood. Um, that's, that's one of the keys about this value add is that we've got a property <clears throat> that is in, it's in, it's in an okay neighborhood, but this is one of the kind of the properties that needs the most attention. And so everybody in the neighborhood, especially the listing broker who owns a, a property in the, in the same neighborhood is kind of rooting for us to, to get this deal and complete our value add because then everyone else's properties are going to look better. Um, as far as sales, um, the listing broker provided, you know, some duplexes that sold and those were selling at like 200, I think $225,000 a unit. There's a couple of duplexes in the neighborhood that sold for 450. Um, I think I saw a triplex that sold for 580. Um, so, we can we can definitely pull some of those comps and, and send it out to everyone. But I mean, again, there's not a lot of nine units being sold in the area. So typically, right. investment property is based all off income and then net operating uh, income after expenses. Right, I get that. And in my head is more in in uh, single family and, and duplexes. And yeah. one of the but, yeah. interesting things too is that um, we've got two tax lots, so we could potentially sell them separately. Yeah. Um, at a higher value. So yeah, right. there's a, basically there's a fourplex and a fiveplex. Um, so we could sell one as a fourplex and one as a fiveplex on an exit. And um, so currently as well too, in the pro forma are, as we've underwritten it, um, we're, I think we're buying at like a, what, like a five or five and a half uh, cap rate, Chris, is that right? Uh, no, I think it's higher. I think it's like a six. Okay. And then on, on exit, our, the cap rate is increased. So um, what it's, it's a way to be conservative in underwriting and just because we don't know what the, the future holds as the market. But there's, uh, I mean, a lot of the income properties in multifamily right now kind of in this space are selling in that five to six range. Okay. And how do you see, I mean, related to that kind of future projection, um, you know, everybody's talking about, about, uh, you know, downturn and I know it's less, has less impact in the, in the rental space, but, uh, how do you see that potentially impacting this? So the, the market in Portland, um, is oversaturated right now with zero bedroom and one bedroom. Uh, and they have just overbuilt um, and continue to, to build. But we haven't, still have an influx of people with the job market increasing. Um, the rate of increase, I think, is decreasing uh, a tiny bit. Um, with this particular property, all the unit types are two bedroom, one bedroom, and above. Um, so nobody is building any more of these units. Uh, so the marketability of them has actually increases as the time goes on, um, which is a great, great opportunity. Uh, also the, the space that they're in, it's not class A. Um, this is right now, I'd, I'd say the, the property is probably class C minus, and we're going to raise it up to a class B. Um, it's going to be a working type person. Um, and, and those type of people have, uh, fairly steady jobs. There's a lot of them. It's not like this population is going to go away. So um, it's we feel that it's a, a very good space to be in, and the um, there's not a lot of development uh, going on in this area as well. So it's not like there's a bunch of added new units coming online uh, down in Tualatin, um, and the so the. We, we believe that this, this space is a really good space. Cool. Thank you. Um, and as well, my take on it is um, 
you know, with, with rent control in Oregon, um, if, if there was a downturn, I think that that makes Oregon a little more attractive to, to move to, um, knowing that if, if you have to rent, you've got protections in place. And even though that's a little bit of a misnomer and that rent control increases rents um, based on all of the other, all the experience and all the data that um, it is out there, especially in San Francisco. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that's going for Oregon, especially for landlords and, uh, you know, investment property owners. So I, I expect rents to, to increase and, you know, I expect vacancy um, to stay low, especially at this property. Um, the neighborhood is at 100% occupancy. Um, and, you know, I think I saw a, a two bedroom, one bath go up uh, for 1350 a few days ago. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not on the, the internet anymore. So my, my guess is that it got rented out and it rented out quickly. Thank you. Um, cool. Let's dive back in. Why don't we talk about uh, closing and just uh, the kind of the breakup of the, um, the cash that we are trying to raise. So um, we're trying to raise $450,000. Our construction budget is roughly 150. Um, and then the down payment is going to be, um, it's 200, two, about 262. It's the 1.135 times 25% minus that 63,000. Yeah. What's wow. nice about this deal is the 63,000 in repairs gets directly credited towards the down payment. So it reduces the LTV of the project, which makes it a little bit more valuable. Because each dollar invested into the project is worth more because we don't have to put as much down. So, uh, yeah, with the particular loan that we're trying to get right now is through U.S. Bank, and there's there's no closing costs except for the appraisal. Um, it's seventy five percent LTV, and what's really nice about it is that there's no prepayment penalties. If we went with uh, an agency type loan, like a Freddie Mac apartment loan, um, you get locked into it um, with pretty stiff prepayment penalties or yield maintenance, um, which is essentially, you know, on a million dollar loan, you're looking at like, you know, between a hundred and $120,000 to, uh, cancel that loan early. Um, and then if you choose a five-year loan, then you only have a three month period to either refinance or to pay that loan off. So it's having the no prepayment penalty with us bank is, um, is great because it allows us to potentially look at refinancing the property and maybe having a, a cash event where we're able to get, you know, a hundred percent or, 90% of all of our investors funds back. And then we're just able to ride out into the sunset getting cash flow um, on a nice little nine unit asset that we can potentially keep for a long period of time. Um, but yeah. Um, any other AJ, do you have any thoughts on the, the use of funds? Oh, um, no, I mean, like the down payment, I think it's like 260. Uh, we got 153 in the budget for construction. And then I believe that there is some, uh, the remaining 35,000 is for closing costs and uh, escrow and operating funds. So there's just some minimal stuff there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the $450,000 is more than the down payment. So there's going to be money in the operating account. We're going to immediately start um, construction on the roofs and 
uh, getting the, the properties prepped to be painted. And, uh, but that money is going to be sitting in the operating account and we'll, um, that, that will be in one of our trust accounts for the property management company. Um, AJ and I also own the property management company that is going to be managing the property, uptown properties. Um, and then as well, we are going to be the general contractor on the repairs, um, just as a disclaimer as well. Um, but we've been successful um, on many other projects and our property management company is one of the most highly rated in all of Portland. So that's something that we're very proud of. And part of the reason why we're very interested in uh, doing these deals is because our company is vertically integrated and so that we're able to provide all the services uh, that an investor would need um, to to do a value add project like this. Uh, cool. Do we, so, do you want to go through any more of the distribution stuff? Or do I think, think we hit that pretty well. Uh, did you guys have any questions about um, if, you know, if uh, cash flow was received, um, how that would get paid out or if, uh, you know, if the, property was sold, um, you know, how, how that would get paid out. I, I do, um, this is Tom, I, I do have a question uh, regarding uh, your previous segment there. Um, since you're the general contractor, I guess, is there some assurance that what the general contractor is going to be charging are in line with market rates and, and you know, just so that we know that that's not being up to a certain percentage or that it's what a, another general contractor would reasonably be charging to do similar work. Absolutely. A AJ, do you want to? Um, yeah, we, we have, uh, I, have a, we, I have a rate sheet for uh, Shepherd Brothers Management that I can send over, um, but essentially it's $55 an hour for uh, labor. Uh, which is under market um, here. We that is one of our selling points of the property management company is we have a great maintenance service. Um, uh, and then any subcontractors, it's cost plus fifteen percent. Um, materials is cost plus fifteen percent, and we line item everything out with actual receipts as well. Um, so we're we try to be as transparent as possible uh, with the construction. Um, and I think that. We, I think at the bottom of the uh, LLC agreement, we ag agreed to hold uh, the rates for both the property management company and the construction company for two years to uh, you know, provide that assurance. Um, so even if market conditions change, this, we'd still uh, hold those rates for two years. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then as well, we're, we're real estate investors. Like we've got a um, investment portfolio uh, that, that we own and like making sure that the property performs and that we're not wasting money on CapEx is paramount to our mindset. And we're really wanting to, um, encourage anyone who invests with us that we're that you know there there is uh alpha to be had in real estate and that we're we're going to provide a great return and a great service so um we're we we uh, one of one of the things that <laughs> aj and i have always um I don't know, like, like this just happened is that the construction company is not a huge profit center for us. It is a way to um, service our properties and service our clients. So that's, that's just kind of a, a mindset that we have always operated on. Yeah, we've, we've always had it out of necessity uh, from doing our own projects. And uh, it's, it makes it very easy to go pull permits, to go do whatever. 
needs to be done within the city um, and then also deal with any of the jurisdictions. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we have a license uh, for general contracting, both residential and commercial. And then as well, we have a uh, plumbing contract or a, a plumbing license. So we can pull plumbing permits and um, we, we work with a few journeymen who um, W2 with us. So yeah. Tom, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. Um, Chris, do you want to talk about taxes and sure. uh, the maybe kind of our overall strategy with taxes, which I think is not something that we touched too much on in the document, uh, just because disclaimer, we are not attorneys or CPAs. And if you have specific tax related advice, please contact your CPA or your attorney about it. Yeah. Um, so we're real estate professionals. That's a status in the, uh, IRS that where any, um, returns that we make re related to real estate basically just goes directly to all of our other business income. Um, that's, uh, a stat is essentially you need, need to be spending more than 200 hours a year, uh, as a working actively on real estate to achieve that status or you, or you need some sort of license um, or yeah, but I, but as well, I'm not a, a CPA. So it's, it's something that you would talk with your CPA about. Um, so going into uh, diving into the, the real estate benefit or the tax benefits of real estate. Um, first benefit to talk about is depreciation. Um, depreciation is huge and we, are very, um, I guess, aggressive when it comes to uh, generating depreciation because then, you know, when the property is cash flowing and we receive that cash, um, you don't, we don't have to pay uh, taxes on that cash flow. Um, so, kind of the way that that works is we will purchase a property. Um, and then we will decide on what the building value is and what the land value is. Um, so generally we choose a number that relates with the replacement cost of the building. So something based like required by our lender uh, to have insurance on the property. So we'll take that insurance value and be like, okay, that is a brand new property uh, that is, you know, that replacement cost will, will equate to a brand new property. And so the way that um, previous tax cases have worked in choosing a building value is that the IRS is going to be looking for some building value that is going to relate to the state of the building as it is right now. Current, so, current condition. Yeah. So we have to take that brand new building cost and, um, depreciated a little bit. So what I do is I, based on each year, because, um, you, you know, the depreciation is a little bit of a phantom cost. Um, the building's actually not, you know, dwindling down to nothing, um, which is a great thing about real estate. So what I'll do is I'll, um, depending on the, the, uh, age of the building, I will subtract about, or I'll, I'll subtract $500 per year um, off of that replacement cost and depreciate it down. So with this property, um, our lender is going to require a, you know, insurance coverage up to the loan. So that's 968,000. Uh, and then this building was built in 1978. So that's 41 years ago. So I'll um, declare that the building value is uh, $948,000 and that the land value is um, the difference between the purchase price and the $948,000. So this, is, this is different than uh, a normal, if you just give it to your CPA, they take the easy route and typically just look on the uh, assessed value. 
um, and that asset, the assessed value is going to assess the land at a much higher rate. Um, so what this does is it increases, in short, it, it, it increases the improvement value, which increases the amount of depreciation we can take. So then we'd um, divide that by the 27 and a half years, um, and we'd get our yearly depreciation. Um, but actually, before we divide that by the 27 and a half years, we'll pull out any personal property um, and any like blinds or um, it, any, anything that is not like a, a fixture in the, uh, the property, we'll, we'll pull those out as personal property and depreciate those um, as one-time expenses um, just to increase the depreciation amount in the first year. Um, and then as well, um, we are going to do a cost segregation study and that is going to generate a lot more um, depreciation because it breaks out what is 30 year property, or I guess um, 27 and a half year property. And then it breaks things out uh, further into um, what is 15 year property, what is seven year property and what is five year property. And so like carpet, that would be something that's considered five year property because that's only going to last that amount of time. Um, whereas, you know, uh, studs in the wall, those are going to be, that's going to be 27 and a half year property because that's well protected and it should last pretty much forever. Um, concrete, concrete's considered 15 year property. So any um, building or like driveways or um, foundation. Like foundation in the, like in a garage, um, but the actual foundation is considered 27 and a half year property. That's not going anywhere. Um, so that's what the cost segregation does is it breaks it out. And so then so that, front, all, front, that front loads all the depreciation. So there's more depreciation yeah. in the first five years than there is in the last five years. So it allows you to take a bigger loss um, those first five years. And that's great because we can produce a, you know, a tax savings for the members of the LLC. Um, but then there is also, you know, depreciation is a double-edged sword and that um, upon a sale, there is depreciation recapture tax. And so that's 25%. And the reason why um, it's generally a good thing is because most of our investors will hopefully be in above the 25% tax bracket. Otherwise, um, that depreciation is, is tough. So um, that's, we're, we are planning on taking um, as much depreciation up front as possible. And then if we do sell, um, out of those gains, we're just going to have to pay the depreciation recapture tax. Cool. Any any questions on taxes? Silence. I know. <laughs> everybody, everybody loves taxes. <laughs> um, I have a question about the distributions. So, are you with the cash flow distributions? Are you planning on doing that monthly, quarterly, or how how does that work? Quarterly. Okay. And then at the end of the year, you guys will get a K1 uh, from the LLC. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then you talked about the possibility of a refinancing. I guess it sounds like the uh, the limited investors are, are not going to necessarily be in part of that decision making. So you guys will look at the market and the capital markets and decide whether or not to try to refinance out of the initial acquisition loan early is there also a uh a possibility that the uh, project would be kept longer term than this uh, five-year time horizon that you're talking about there, there is a possibility that it could be kept longer um just we we want to produce the highest return possible so if uh, the for sale market is not ideal um you know we 
we're, we're going to use our experience and make sure that we're going to produce the highest and best return for, um, the, for the company and for our investors. So we're, we're pretty reasonable guys too. I mean, like we know that we, the reason we chose five years is because this is one of our first deals and we're, we're committed to if, if that's what the majority of people want to do after five years of sell, then by all means, like we're, we're not going to turn away and say, Oh no, we, we want to keep it. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're of the mindset that we, we want to please as many of the investors as possible. So it's not like we're just going to be making decisions by ourselves off in a room. Um, there'll be plenty of communication and, an opportunity to have your voice heard. Uh, it's not like we're unreasonable people or anything. Um, and I guess in tune with that as well is we, you know, the, the goal of the investment is to meet, you know, that 19.8 IRR like that. That is why we're doing this. This is, it's an investment. Um, and you know, we, we want to produce that return. Um, for our clients that return or better. And so we, we're going to make the decisions um, based on that goal. And we're going to keep that goal in mind when we're making our decisions. And if we feel, you know, that um, the best time to sell might be early, then we're, we, we would do that as well. So it's, it's really based on the investment and, Yes, we are going to take input, but if that um, affects the, you know, how successful the investment's going to be, um, we're, we're going to be siding with making the investment successful. That's, that's our main goal of doing this. Um, so that's, that's kind of our mindset on that. Chris, did that answer your question? Yeah, that's, that does. Sweet. Uh, Chris, do you, what do we want to talk, what do we want to talk about next? I think, I think we've kind of hit it all. Um, the operating agreement is, uh, it's, it's a little long, um, but that's our attorneys, you know, trying to figure out every single situation. This, this summary, um, is in tune with what the operating agreement says. And we've worked with our attorney to make sure that the, the operating agreement reflects um, these, these goals and you know, these, these layman's terms. So. I have a question. Yeah. Um, would this be, would a self-directed IRA or a 401k plan be able to invest in this? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the the one caveat there and just just so you're you know full fully aware is i don't think an ira can take depreciation um so you may not be getting all of the the benefits of the uh the the vehicle or the investment but yeah it will still get the cash on cash return and um all of the the proceeds but yeah IRA completely available. Great. Um, yeah, I just kind of browse through this real quick. Yeah, does, does anybody else have any other questions? I have one more question. I noticed that it's built in 78. Did you guys do you investigate whether there's any asbestos or lead paint issues you're gonna have to deal with? Um, we've not done those invasive studies. Um, so that is, that's currently an unknown. Um, but in those type of situations, we're, you know, gonna be covering them up as opposed to uh, going all the way and remediating. So, um, you know, if there's asbestos in the ceilings, we're just gonna keep, we're just gonna paint over those and uh, there's just gonna be popcorn ceilings. And then in regards to lead paint. Some of, some of the asbestos ceilings in other units, we've actually just put another layer of quarter inch drywall over and then retextured and repainted. 
literally just go right over it. Um, as far as like lead paint, not remediating uh, and just trying to go over it as much as possible. Sounds good. Yeah, it was built in 1978 or pre-1978? Built in 78. So you should be all right because the lead-based paint renovate right laws only apply to pre-1978. So probably Sweet. okay there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, what's the for, for future, are, is your construction company uh, lead-based paint certified so you could do work on yes. pre-1978 homes? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we are. Um, one of the other added benefits of this property that we've not factored in is that it is in the opportunity zone. So, you know, if, if we do refinance and then... Uh, the max goes in and then there's just heavy demand for this neighborhood. Um, maybe there's a, you know, large development that wants to go in or something. Um, you know, that, that could be an added benefit. Um, as of right now, we don't have any plans to utilize opportunity zone funds and do the necessary value add that we would need to, um, to have those funds be tax free or, um, as far as that, but that, that is an added benefit. It is in the opportunity zone. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for, uh, you know, participating. Uh, we're, we, we appreciate your interest and, uh, you know, thanks for helping us get through this. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to it. We, we think it's going to be a great investment. Um, like I said, we're we're investing in in our cell, ourselves, and uh, yeah, should be should be real good. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks. Awesome. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. We'll see you guys later. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.